we've been going through a series for quite a while, and it'll carry us all the way into November about what a church is and what a church isn't. And it's a, it's a big topic. Yeah, you know, you kind of you have to pick and choose where you're going to start and stop on that. I'll tell you one of the ways we're going to be the church uh, in a week from tonight in, in this room. Let's see, August 20th. We have a graphic for it. Do we have it up there? Yeah, Winning the Battle of the Mind. And uh, we, I've been looking for a title. We talked, we talked about spiritual agreements, and that's what we're going to talk about. But I've been searching for months for a better description of what that small course is. We're going to be looking at the, the book of uh, Colossians for about an hour and a half. And if you went through that earlier in the year, a lot of you showed up for that, and we got a lot of great feedback for it. Um, but if you, if you didn't get to come, bring a Bible, bring a pen and a pad. But here's why we're going to deal with this. Freedom and spiritual freedom is a big part of Clearview's understanding of the Scriptures, that Jesus came to set us free. And a lot of times you're told things like, well, you've you got to control what you think about yourself. Or as it says in Proverbs, as a, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. You know, we're told to do that, but a lot of times we're not told how, how to do it. Practically speaking... When, when, I, when I get angry at somebody, what do I do with that? If I've noticed that over time I've got, I've got some, some pretty heavy thoughts that won't leave me, that's causing me anxiety, how do I match up the power of God with what I'm feeling, right? So we're going to deal with those things. And I'm telling you, uh, anybody, it, it, for anybody in high school or above, uh, it's going to be very transparent. I'm going to walk you through a lot of my own journeys about how I've tried to win in my mind with, with the kind of thinking that the Holy Spirit gives me. And so we're going to do that next Sunday at 6 o'clock, okay? And uh, we're going to stop at 7.30. So hope you get a chance to come to that. Today we're going to talk about church and, and why baptisms matter. I remember, I, rem I, I didn't grow up in church. Um, I, I went to church every now and then, uh, and you know, just but not, it, it wasn't a part of my routine. It wasn't a part of my, my home routine. My, I had great parents. I have great parents now, but the home, uh, my, the family that I live in now with my mom and dad is not the family I grew up in. Uh, Jesus saved our entire household in the span of about a year, uh, right around 1990, 1991. So that's why I've always had a deep affinity for people that don't know Jesus, because I remember what that was like and what that felt like. And I remember the day, um, I, I kind of, I went from pagan to prophet in about four months. Um, my friends' heads were spinning. Uh, because they're like, didn't I just see you at a party like a few months ago? Yes, yes, you did. Um, <laughs> can we talk, talk about that? Uh, you know, um, but I, uh, I, I, had, I, I was living one way, and, and I, I was one of those rare dudes that, that had a Damascus Road experience. I, I, I often say, and to use church language, I didn't get saved. I, I ran into Jesus, uh, smack into him, and, and never been the same. But I remember standing in those waters, and I had on blue shorts and, and a white T-shirt, and and uh, all my friends were out there, and, and I remember just uh, that, that f the, f the way the water felt on, on, on me, and I remember the, the pastor saying things over me, and, and I remember him putting me under that water and me coming up out of that, and, and it was, uh, boy, it was hard to describe, and, and then we had this little church, and uh, God, I, I didn't know it, I mean, I, you know, the reason I talk so much about what I know can happen the reason I talk so much at Clearview about what happens if a church repents, I promise you something, all of Clearview's problems go away in a single moment if we all repent. I'm telling you, all of our problems go away if we repent. That's the honest truth, because I, I lived it for three and a half years. I, I watched this little church grow and grow and grow and people becoming Christians and people giving their lives to Christ. And I lived in a small town and I knew some of those people, right? And they knew me. And I saw, and, and for three and a half years, I, I grew up in a church where, where every Sunday when you, when, or that I, I started going to a church when I was 17, and, and, I, and I remember for three and a half years, you got up every Sunday not wondering um, who would come to Christ that day, it was how many. 
And, and it, was, it was interesting to watch. And, and so I watched God overcome a lot of things that our church didn't have, man. Um, I mean, we have 17 million times the resources that my little church had. We had an upright piano that sat right over there. We had an organ that sat right over there that some lady played funeral music on. And, uh, and, 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 and I mean, it was sad. And she was a sweet lady, I am sure. But it was, the, the worship was sad, man. It was sad. I was used to listening to Led Zeppelin and everything else. And it was sad. And, and, and then I, I came into, but we had, we sang out of these books called hymnals and, uh, and I'm telling you, uh, Jesus saves people and it, and I've always been convinced at that moment, you, you know, there's a lot of things you don't have to have and things you do have to have. But, but the reality was, I remember when I got baptized and it was over, I, I didn't, I mean, we, I don't know, back, we're working on our baptistry over there. We got all kinds of issues with that and. But like the, the, our baptistry area over there in the other building is larger than my college apartment was, and that's the honest truth. We didn't have attendance. We didn't have people helping you with towels, and nobody even had a towel. Thank God, I knew to bring a towel, you know. And and so I, I was. I I came out of it, and I, I walked up in there, and I remember everybody was waiting on me, but I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere. Because I had to cry for a minute. And I remember sitting on these little steps. They were, they were kind of over on this side. And I thought, I'm, I'm crying. I can't go out there and let them see me. They're going to think I didn't like my baptism or something. you know. And, uh, but I remember the visual, man, of, of how that felt. And so baptisms do matter. And, and they matter a lot. And so, so I, I remember feeling not just the water, but I remember feeling a new heart. I, I, I remember having compassion for people that I literally, ashamed to say it, but literally once hated. I remember looking at people different. I began looking at life different, and I didn't have the capacity. That, that, something changed in me, and I knew it, and I didn't read a book. I mean, something had inhabited me, and now I obviously know it was the power of God. But baptisms are something that do matter and they are an indicator we're kind of in this phase of this church series talking about what okay what are indicators of a healthy church because you've heard me preach over the last several weeks we know attendance isn't the sign of a healthy church I mean attendance is great and all but let's face it I mean you can you can be full of heresy and running 8,000 people on Sunday I, I, I really just don't care about that anymore um, money, anybody can give money. In fact, you don't even have to be a Jesus follower to give money to Clearview. We will take anybody's money. At the, and, and uh, you know, I, may, I say anybody. Maybe we won't. I should maybe defer that to the finance team. But, but I don't know. I'll take it, um, you know. But, but the reality is, no, you, you don't even have to be a Jesus follower to give money, right? So a budget isn't always an indicator. It, it is one indicator of health, but it's not the only indicator of health. Right? It's not the only indicator of, of what a healthy church looks like. But baptisms do matter, and they matter a lot. And so I'm going to read, I want to show you a passage of Scripture. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2. And this isn't one of those passages that you exegete, so to speak. There's not like these seven constructs of deep theological meaning that I'm going to have to pull out of here because it's not there. We see a, an early church that baptized people. It was a behavior it's important that you know that. Baptism, them baptizing people were, were behaviors they were literally acting out in real time. They, they were baptizing people because they were sharing Jesus with people. And so Acts chapter 2, let me give you the context here. Peter has preached, Peter has, um, has preached this amazing sermon. And, and here's what you've got to understand about the sermon in Acts chapter 2. Okay, you read the sermon. I don't think you maybe, I don't think the average person understands the gravity of it. Peter is standing in front of a whole bunch of Jews, okay, Pharisees, Sadducees, all kinds of Jewish top shelf kind of people, and here's what he's saying to him, you killed him. The only Messiah you're ever going to get, you killed him. Let me, let me give you the modern day equivalent of that. It would be like me going to Iran, walking into the capital, standing on their capital steps and telling all of them that Muhammad is a false prophet that their entire religious system is based on falsehoods and deception. I will not make it out of that context. They will kill me. No, really. They will kill me if I did that. That's what Peter did. 
He stood in front of all those people and said, this is, this is who Jesus is, this is what he did, and you killed him. And he came out of the grave and he shared the gospel with them. And, and so it, it was the very bold move. And then at the, at, in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter the rest, and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What do we do? And Peter said to them, You repent. Repent. Notice he didn't say join a church. He didn't say start going to a small group. He said you need to repent. And then each of you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them. See, preachers are allowed to go at, over time. It says he, verse 40, I just now realized that. I've never really thought of that verse that way, but that's my new favorite verse that where I don't have, uh, I can keep going as long as I want. And with many other words, he kept on tes testifying to them. Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word, those that fell under the authority, of the word of God were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Well, that's a church service, isn't it? <laughs> what we see in the book of Acts is we see churches popping up everywhere. Small house churches. It wasn't campuses like American churches. It was small house churches popping up all over the place. And they were baptizing people. And it was a behavior that was an outflow of who they were. And so let's ask for just a quick minute. What does baptism symbolize? Because I don't want to assume that some of you know. I, I, I learned a long time ago, don't, don't assume. Some of you, this might be the first time, just like me. Just like me. It was, I mean, I remember, you know, when, uh, when I walked into church and when I was 17 years old, there were some people that kind of, you know, oh, hey, Jason, you know. I remember when I first went to FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes had a huge impact on my life. And I remember the first time I showed up on Wednesday morning at 7.30 before school started and walked up in there, I thought all of them were going to pass out. Um, they're like, hey, that's when you know you're an outsider, right? Hey, how are you? You know, that's what, that was the reception I got. You know, it's, it's okay. I understood. So I, I didn't know a thing. I didn't know a thing about the Christian faith much. I just knew I was a sinner and I needed a savior. So here's what baptism symbolizes. It's really simple. It, it symbolizes death, burial, and resurrection. You see, every time we put somebody in those waters, whether my, I baptized my two boys in a creek, and that was awesome. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that, was, that was their choice, and that's what they wanted to do. And um, Hey, I'm interested. I'll, this isn't in my sermon notes. This is just Jason taking a little bit of executive liberty. How many of y'all were baptized in a creek? Anybody in here? A few of you? Yeah, small country churches back in the day, they didn't have a baptistry, man. Uh, they, you had to wait till summer, <laughs> right? Uh, so, they, but every time we put somebody in the water, it's symbolic of, of, of really Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified in Christ, and I no longer live. But the life I do live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Right? So I've been crucified in Christ, and I no longer live. Jesus died. Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again. And it shows that, in, that our old life has passed away and our new life has come. So that's what, that's what baptisms are symbolic of. They're not magic. They're, you know, you don't, you're, not, you're not transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light just because you go through the water. But it's, it's symbolic of what happens to us when what Jesus has already done. So we know what they symbolize, but let me ask you a different question. What do baptisms reveal? What do they reveal? What do they indicate? Baptisms are indicators. They really are. And they're indicators of a church. Uh, so we're, we're doing this church series, and, and we're kind of trying to ask the question, okay, wh what are indicators that a church is healthy I believe there are places that our church at Clearview is healthy. I think there's places we're pretty healthy. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's a group of people, man. I mean, we're not going to be healthy in every, every turn. We're just not. We're, we're all human beings, and we need to give ourselves permission to be human. There's a lot of things wrong with our church, and there's a lot of things right with our church, right? So, you know, welcome to the, to the normal world of people. 
So but, but what, what, they are an indicator of a church, and, and what, they, what they're indi- indicative of is baptisms indicate a group of people who care about other people, who aren't their people. You follow me? Baptisms indicate a group of people who have a burden for other people who aren't their people. And that's why baptisms show that it matters of what that we share in Christ. And if we're not, it's going to show up. Now, I want to tell you, um, I've, I've all, I think I started out my life as like an um, ignorant optimist. Might have been what I was all the way through my 20s. I was just, then I, maybe I, then I might have became a blind optimist. Um, I'm still optimistic, but I've made a commitment to myself to do my best to be honest. Um, if you know much about disc profiles, my, one of my letters is a high I. We lie to ourselves a lot. You know, uh, no matter what it is, it's always better than what it really is. We, we're just high, we're high eyes, man. We're, we're people that, that, you know, the, the glass is not, not just half full. There's a glass and there's a whole bunch of water in it, you know, and that's kind of how we look at it. And, you know, my wife's a realist. She may be the mayor of Realville. I don't know. Um, but, but I, you know, I'm, I, I'm not. And, and so she helps me with that. She's like, hey, you need to be honest with yourself because there's many times I'm not honest with myself. And so I, I, try, to look at, I try to look at things as they actually are. And I've made a commitment to do that from the pulpit as well. And so here's, here's a reality that part of being a shepherd is not just petting sheep. Part of being a shepherd is giving you what you need. Part of that is what you need to know. And if you look at our baptism numbers for the last 12 years, our baptisms have gone right along with our attendance. For 12 years... Our baptism numbers have sunk just like our attendance has. For 12 years, Clearview has been in a decline. And it's time we start being honest about that. We have to own that. That's a reality. It's not the news that we want to hear, but if you've been here long enough, you're not shocked. Now, here's, here's something interesting, and I don't understand. I, I, it's interesting how people in the church growth world sometimes miss... Uh, statistics wildly and then sometimes they hit it right on the head and man after COVID man whoever is putting out those numbers man they're doing a good job because as we've watched numbers Clearview was I don't know somewhere in the eight to nine hundred range right before right before COVID uh, 750 to 900 maybe somewhere in that range but let's just call it an even 800 something and the church by most statistics and what we're seeing post COVID the church across America is slowly coming back but we're still anywhere from 40 30 to 40 percent less thinner than we were before COVID hit. And it's funny, that's exactly where Clearview is. It's really interesting how we are tracking right along with the national narrative in a lot of those cases. Now, if you look at the reality of our baptism numbers, it, it shows something that, that I think we, we have to own. And what we have to own is it's time that we stop blaming a staff for that or a worship ministry area for that or stop blaming committees that are for decisions stop blaming our small group ministry stop blaming student ministry stop blaming anything a campus start stop blaming a culture that no longer is the, the culture's left the church and you know we're the right ones and they're all the wrong ones I mean there's a whole lot of blame we can place in a lot of places but let me tell you the reality is this is an everybody at Clearview problem this is an everybody problem. This is a problem. This is a problem for Jason. It's a problem for Graham. It's a problem for Shane. It's a problem for Alexis. It's his problem. You know what? It's Tommy's problem. Right? It's Lanny's problem. It's Trey's problem. It's Rob's problem. It's Melinda, Melinda's problem. Right? It's Jenny's problem. It's Sally's problem. It's everybody's problem. We have to own this. We have to own the fact that this is something that we need to look at hard. 
Because at the end of the day, this will change overnight if we change. Now, I want to say here, so that's, that's, that, those are the cold, hard facts. But let me tell you the, the good news. None of us, including me, can change what has happened in 12 years. Can't change it at all, but I'll tell you what we can change. We can change the next 12 years. We sure can. You know what I love about Clearview? This, this may sound a little bit weird to you. It wouldn't be the first time you thought I was weird. I'm kind of adjusting to it. One of the things that gives me energy about Clearview is it's a real human story. I, I love that we are a church trying to find our way back to God's best. I love that. I love that we are a church that has gone through a lot not just one thing, just a bunch of stuff, and, and you look it up one day, and it's different. And, but we're a church. One, one thing I love about this church is that we don't quit. You guys aren't quitters. I love that. For those of you that are here, you're not, you haven't quit, and I love that about you. I, and I love that it's a human story because what I see is the people trying to find their way back to kingdom living, and I love that, and it gives me energy. So we can't change the last 12 years. In fact, in fact, a lot of you that are guests now and knew it, clear of you, man, the feedback we're getting from y'all is like, man, thank you. I mean, you, you, you guys are, are so happy and excited about what, what you're experiencing at Clearview. And I'm like, I agree with you. There is life here. There really is. But we're going to be, listen, we're going to be honest about the dysfunction. We just are. Because you can't heal if you don't talk about it. So... We can't change the last 12 years, but we can change the, the upcoming 12 years for sure. So what baptisms indicate, when I look at this verse, is that baptisms indicate a redeemed people who understand the gospel. When you look at these people in the book of Acts, after Peter's sermon, these people began to baptize other people. If you look in Acts chapter 4, you, not, you don't have to turn there now, but if, it kind of continues over into Acts chapter 4. And what you see were these people that were giving their whole lives to a movement. They were, they were, give, they were, they were literally school teachers and stay-at-home moms. They were dads. They were senior citizens. They were teenagers. They were stay-at-home moms, plumbers, bankers, mortgage lenders. They were people of all, retired people. But what came first for them was the kingdom of God. And that's why you saw the power that was put on them. They had their main priority as the main priority. And, and, and an outflow of people that have the main priority as the main priority, the outflow of that is that they will share their faith. And that's what began to happen. They were literally living out loud about Jesus. They were living out loud. They weren't keeping it inside, and they weren't just posting it on Facebook for other Christians that follow them to see, which is great. Keep posting whatever you post on social. That's great. But I'm telling you, people don't come to Christ unless we tell them, unless we share it with them. So when you see a church baptizing people, what you see is a church that understands the gospel the urgency of the gospel. And I want to talk about that for a minute. The urgency of the gospel matters. The gospel is not a theory. The gospel is a person. His name is Jesus. The gospel is not just people going to church. I hear people all the time, well, they need to be in church. No, they don't. They need to repent. Church take care of itself. <laughs> Come to Jesus. Church tends to take care of itself after that. No, what, what needs to happen, I think, is we have to be, start being honest, friends, in our churches. And I will tell you something. I think, and, and, and maybe, I don't know if I'm allowed to apologize for churches, but I'm going to, whether or not I'm allowed to. I'm going to tell you that I think people like me, I think we've done a bad job over the last 50 years on the reality of heaven and hell. I really do. 
Because we want our messages to be positive, and we want the community to be positive, and we want everybody to know what a, what a and positive is great. But I want to tell you something, friends. A gospel that isn't willing to talk about hell isn't a gospel. It's not a gospel. Because hell is real. But so is heaven. So we have to tell both. I never share the gospel with somebody that I don't tell them both. Because people need to know that there is a consequence for rejecting who Jesus is. See, this is what hell is. Hell is this. Hell isn't God being mean or mad. People ask the question all the time in church circles, or actually just really for thousands of years, how can a loving God send people to hell? That's a very simple answer. He didn't do that. They did it. To themselves. Now, it's not that I don't have mercy. I'm just saying, think about it, friends. If you don't want anything to do with God here on this earth, if you don't want anything to do with Jesus, if you don't want anything to do with the authority of Jesus over your life, when you die, God will grant you your wish. You, did, you didn't want anything to do with him here. He's not going to force himself on you. Did you notice that in Acts chapter 2, when Peter is preaching, one of the things that jumped out to me this week when I was studying it was verse 41. So then, those who had received his word... See, something has to happen for you to repent. You have to receive the authority of the word of God. You have to receive the authority. You have to fall underneath the authority of who Jesus is. And so he hell is a reality. It is a natural outcome of what happens to people who are, who are wildly unconcerned. And I think what's happened in American culture is that, that we have this idea of hell that, that it is only reserved for the Hitlers of this world. That it's only reserved for the Bin Ladens of this world. Hell is reserved for any person that doesn't repent of their sins. And that includes your grandfather. Because, see, God doesn't look at your grandfather as the grandfather. He looks at him as a person. You see him as granddad. God sees him for who he is. An unrepentant person who wanted nothing to do with me. Hell is reserved not just for Hitler's, it's reserved for your sister who doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. Hell is reserved for people that you work with, that you love. Hell is reserved for people that matter to you a lot because they're good people. Listen, good people go to hell every day. Every day. Because they chose to abandon God. And that's what happens when you do that. So people that are baptizing people, a church that is baptizing people, understands the urgency of the gospel. That we're not just here to make everybody feel better about themselves. What you see in the book of Acts is a church that was leading a movement they were being obedient to Jesus. Jesus said this in, in Matthew 28. He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. Baptizing them. See, that was an outflow of obedience. Uh, it was an outflow of obedience. Churches that are baptizing people understand the gospel. What you see in the book of Acts was a church that understood the gospel and the urgency of the gospel. The church in the book of Acts was not an institution movement. Institutions exist to keep the institution alive. And I think that's a big problem with American churches. We don't exist to keep... The, listen, the, let me, you, you know what this, I am least concerned about at Clearview, if you just want to know inside my head? You know what I am least concerned about? Keeping this church propped up. I am not here to just make a, a, a good church better, improve the campus, paint the walls, have the AC fixed, which we're having a ma major issue with. Shocker. Keep everything running smooth. Honestly, that makes me want to puke. Pretty graphic. 
Let me find a different word. Go to sleep. Boring. I'm not here to prop up a church. And boy, I hope you wouldn't be either. Because that's just a building and an address on Franklin Road. I am here to be a part of a people that want to see God do something more than they want to eat. I am here for that. I'm all in for that. I'm all in for that. See, churches that baptize people understand the urgency of the gospel. That's what we know. But I've got to be transparent with you about something. Um, I thought about this this week. I don't think I've done a really good job with sharing the gospel as much as I should. I mean, we should all share the gospel more. I, I think for people like me that do what I do, we get so wrapped up in helping Christians that we forget that there was a time when none of us were. And so we exist and we, we end up propping up a church the whole time going, what's wrong? Well, it's because we're trying to make ourselves better for our own selves and we become our own best customers. And uh, there's some incre- this church is full of incredibly smart business people. And I'm telling you, if you're your own best customer, bankruptcy is close. <laughs> I mean, that's not rocket science. Even I know that. I don't think I've done a great job. I, mean, I share the gospel with people. There are people that, even in the last few years, I've sat down, looked them in the eye, sat in their homes, told them about who Jesus was because I cared about them. But I think I could do a lot better, to be honest. I really do. And I'm not just saying that because it sounds like the thing to say in something like that. I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel better. I'm really not. I think sometimes I hide behind what I know my strengths are. Like if, if, if you look at, and this is way more information than you probably know about how we look at what we call church growth, what we especially call evangelism, which is a word we never use anymore. We talk, I think we call it um, gospel conversations or something. Anyway, talking to people about Jesus, okay, is what we're going to talk about. So one of the things I do better with is what we would call I'm a sower, and I know that about me. I do share the gospel a lot with books I write, videos I've produced over the years, projects that I've pioneered in certain spaces. I've gotten to share the gospel with hundreds of thousands of people. But the reality is sometimes looking somebody in the eye is not something I do great. And I'll often chalk it up to, well, I'm a sower. I'm a person, and I actually am. I am, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with the fact that, you know, let's go to a farming analogy, right? Corn doesn't grow overnight, right? I mean, you've got to put a seed in the ground for you to, you know. And listen, for all of you that don't realize it, I mean, I, I love farmers. I'm around farmers all the time, and I'm telling you, if you had any idea of what it took to get that bean to your fork, you would be humbled. It is hard. Sowers is what sowing is what I do best, but no farmer I know only plants. They harvest, and I got to do better at that. And that's a God thing; I can't force it. But I'm going to start praying to be more top of mind for me to hear people when I know and listen when I know they're far from God. You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter, but sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world is sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.